What's up, YouTube friends? We've got another episode of Building on an Island. This is a series that my buddy Wade Paquin has been doing for my Build Show Network. We're also publishing here on YouTube. This is episode 12. We're talking about stone veneer, uh, waterproof on the deck. Uh, we're talking about electrical uh, rough ends and the gas piping. This is a really cool project on some crazy logistics. So Block Island is actually off the coast of Rhode Island. And Wade's got to basically take everything out to this job site, manpower and materials included on either a boat or a plane. So with that being said, episode 12, Building on an Island, let's get going. Welcome back to Building on an Island. I'm Wade Paquin and I'm on island today. It's an absolutely gorgeous summer day. You can see the house behind me. We've made some tremendous progress here in the last month. And on this episode, I'm gonna be talking about the exterior stone veneer application and inside the house, electrical rough in and gas piping rough in that's getting us closer to inspections to get that insulation and wallboard going. The Building on an Island series is sponsored by Anderson Windows and Doors the Unicare system, key link fencing and railing, and legend. So if you guys remember a couple episodes ago, we were dealing with some delays here on the project. Um, some of the delays were supply chain issue, right? So that's something actually we're still dealing with and that changes all the time. Um, but over the winter and into the spring, um, we were dealing with some supply chain issues related to exterior products, most notably the sidewall shingle. Now, if you remember on that episode, I was sharing with you guys that we were waiting five or six months somewhere in that neighborhood for the shingles that the client wanted. The shingle here on the house isn't the shingle that was specified. It was not the first choice by the client. Um, we couldn't continue to wait. We were running up against the uh, warranty issue on the zip system because it had to be covered. It couldn't be exposed any longer. Uh, if you remember me talking about that. Um, so we called an audible and we went with a pre-dip shingle. The, sh the shingle that the client originally wanted was a Eastern White Cedar Clear. So just an all natural shingle that naturally weathers. As I said, this is pre-dipped um, and it's formulated so it mimics the weathering process. So all of these shingles will weather into a nice uh, gray color when the chemicals on that stain go through that process. On the other side of the delays, an interior designer was brought on to the project, which we always welcome. We just prefer that they're on board at the beginning. Um, so it took a little bit for the designer to get caught up, work with the client and finalize some of those selections. So uh, now that the client has had a chance to uh, flush out all of the decisions and selections, it's really helped propel the project forward. Um, so you can probably hear the masons behind me. They're on the home stretch of doing the stone veneer work. Um, we've got stone veneer wrapping around the lower level of the house and then again here on the, uh, the two-tiered retaining wall is going to become a planter bed. So let's go take a look at that detail. So I'm over here where the masons are uh, finishing up their stone veneer work. Uh, this is a Delgado stone. Uh, this is called a Connecticut blend. It's about an inch and a quarter thick veneer. You can see the thickness of the stone varies a little bit, but on average it's about an inch and a quarter. Um, and we've got this wrapping around here, what will be this uh, planting bed. So that's a retaining wall and then in front of it. So we didn't have this big retaining wall here. Um, the architect had this idea to kind of create a lower tier and be able to put some plants in here after. Um, but in terms of how this veneer is going up, um, we've got two applications and there's one difference between the two. We've got this application here where the stone is going on uh, concrete. So this isn't the house. Um, and then we've got stone veneer on the house. Now the layering here, the system, the assembly of this is um, pretty simple. Um, here in this application, we've got the concrete behind us, so that's waterproofed. And then we've got our mortar air vent. So this is a ventilation vent, so air and water uh, can drain through here. The water can drain through and air can come up through the vent and dry the water out so we don't have any standing water. All of that water that gets uh, channeled down through this material goes down to the ground into a bed of crushed stone and into a pipe and out to daylight. Then over the top of the ventilation, our air gap uh, material here, we've got our metal lath. The metal lath 
uh, allows the uh, scratch coat, which is this first layer of mortar, to go onto the lath. That's gonna bond uh, the mortar to the lath. And then when we're applying the stone to the lath with mortar um, on the back of the stone, we have a nice mortar to mortar connection, which is a great bond here to keep uh, the stone in place for decades um, of durability. So the only difference over on the uh, house is we have our wall sheathing, which is our zip system, and then we have our hydro gap, uh, weather resistive barrier, and then we pick up uh, these additional layers. So that's the only difference over there uh, on the actual wall of the house. Uh, now in terms of finishing this up, you can see here around the corner, uh, the stone veneer is brought all the way up to the top. And so this will have a nice blue stone um, piece going on the top of the wall, overhanging the stone. And that's gonna create a nice cap detail around the three sides of this planting bed. We'll be able to put some nice soil in here and have some beautiful plants. Uh, we're picking up that blue stone detail over here at our shingle wall transition to stone, right? So we have our shingling detail here. We've got our flashing detail behind the shingles on top of the blue stone ca uh, cap here. So any water that comes down is able to uh, escape off the stone and drip down. And this stone is creating a nice transition piece between uh, wood and stone. Uh, and that's gonna again, tie in nicely with the blue stone cap here. So as we were just talking about um, how that water is being drained behind that stone veneer and into the uh, crushed stone in that drainage pipe, um, we've got another drainage pipe up here that's picking up all the water that's coming off this balcony deck. Now, if you haven't seen the previous episode where we talk about how the water drains off of this fairly large balcony deck, go check that episode out. But basically this entire front edge of this deck allows the water to drain on uh, that rubber membrane up there. So any water that's collected on the deck is coming out and it's coming through a hidden soffit detail up there. That water is now being dumped into the gutter. Now that gutter was not there on the episode when we were going over the details of that system. Now you can see that gutter is kind of integrated, it's kind of tucked back in there uh, instead of being out on the, on the face of that fascia board. Um, so it's, I wouldn't say hidden, but tucked away. All that water is gonna go in that gutter, down the downspouts, and it's going to come out this four inch uh, ADS pipe here and out to daylight. So, you know, we always talk about the importance of uh, water management, right? All the water on the house, we want it to get down and away from the house, and that's exactly what's happening here. That water is coming down into the gutter system, down the downspouts, into our underground drainage pipe and out to daylight far away from the house. It's gonna keep this whole area dry, which provides longevity and durability to all the material here from the framing to the decking um, to the siding, everything will be nice and dry when we can take all that bulk water and get it away from the house. Now, again, speaking of water, we have our hydro gap uh, weather resistive barrier over our zip system. This is our shingling crew here. They are working on the final two sections of the house. So this little section here, turning, turning the corner and uh, they'll be mostly complete with all the siding work. Um, but one thing we did not have on the previous episode when we were starting the shingling work is all of our uh, blocks in. So you can see here we've got a dryer vent that is on a cedar block. So this will weather gray and blend in with the shingles eventually. Uh, this is a lead coated copper dryer vent and we've got uh, some lead here as our flashing detail over the top of that block. So you can see around the corner we've got another uh, cedar block up there for another vent. And if you look closely, you can see the bottom of that block is rabbited out at the bottom. That's gonna allow the shingles to tuck underneath the block instead of the shingles butting up to the block. So really nice detail there. So we're inside the house now, and as I mentioned at the top of this episode, the only two things we have left to get our final rough-in inspection so we can move on to insulation and then wallboard and then ultimately our interior finishes is electrical and gas piping. An electrician has been underway here for several weeks. He's in the home stretch. In terms of what our electrical package looks like here, pretty standard, nothing over the top. There's no major uh, home automation or anything like that here. We basically have a combination of uh, recessed lighting. Uh, so four inch recessed lighting. We're using uh, just a halo recessed can. Uh, we've got some wall sconces and uh, some flush mount. Uh, ceiling fixtures as well. And you can see that right here in, 
in just this small area, right? This is the main entry foyer. Uh, we've got a ceiling mount fixture uh, right over here. So you have the box for that. On this wall, uh, you can see we've got two sconces. Um, now again, because we have an interior designer on board, we have interior wall elevations that tell us what's going on this wall. Perhaps this is a piece, piece of furniture here. Um, there's a receptacle down here. Maybe there's a, a, a lamp on top of that. I'm speculating. Um, but we have specific dimensions for these sconces, um, which is why they're in place. Uh, over here in the hallway, going to the side entry door and the laundry room and the powder room, you can see we've got a couple of four inch recessed cans up here. So you, just in this small area, you're seeing recessed, wall sconces, and those flush mount fixtures. Now here in um, the utility closet, uh, we'll have an additional uh, sub panel. So it'll be a second sub panel. We have one down in the mechanical room in the basement, and then one here. So this is why you see all these wires coming down into the space right now. This will eventually get cleaned up and look uh, really nice, but right now this is just you know getting the wires into the space before the electrician puts the sub panel box in and then starts to bring the wires in and put the circuits in that uh, panel and all that will get uh, cleaned up. And an example of how clean and neat his work is, is right here. You can see we've got uh, two three gang switch boxes here. So um, each time you see a screw, a screw hole or a screw hole, there's one, two, three. So it'll be three switches and three switches. Three is the maximum personally I like to go for. I don't like seeing these side by side or seeing a four gang. Um, it starts to look clunky in my opinion. So uh, we do a three over three, but you can see his nice clean electrical work, right? We've got a lot of wires coming down into these uh, three gang boxes here. And he's done a great job with keeping these wires nice and tight, providing enough slack and something uh, that I think is a great tip uh, here where the wires kind of loop down the bottom and get attached to the stud. He's taken a spare wire, just one of the wires from this Romex and wrapped it around this grouping of wires here to keep that from uh, opening up. So it's keeping that nice and tight. Why is that important? Because now we're gonna be able to insulate that better than having those wires uh, just kind of filling the bay and separating. So nice clean detail there by our electrician, Steve. So one thing we like to do with uh, all of our clients before we put any uh, switch boxes or receptacle boxes up is walk through with the client and just go over those locations, right? We have what's called a reflective ceiling plan, what we call in the trades an RCP. That is basically our electrical plan. It's going to show uh, where our switching is, where our light fixture locations are. Um, but before we put those boxes up, we want the opportunity to walk through with the client, make sure they're happy with those locations. And if they want to change it, now's the time. We don't want to run wires to these boxes only to find out later that the client wanted the switch moved over one or two more studs or to a completely different area, or that there's a receptacle in the way of where a piece of furniture might be going. And here's a perfect example of those two things. We're in a bedroom. The bedroom door, as labeled here on the jam side of the door, says RH. That means right hand. So this is a right hand hinge door. And a little tip for the, what is right hand, what is left hand, is if you're standing with your back up to the jam side of the door, if the door swings this way, to my right, that's a right hand door. If it swings to the left, that's a left hand. So here we have a right hand door swinging into the room, walking into the bedroom, switch location right on the left. So if you're coming in at night, you're walking down the hall, you shut the hall light off, you come in, you wanna light your bedroom, you have a switch right here so you're not walking into the dark. Now down here on this wall, this is going to be the headboard end of the bed. So. Our client will um, have the bed facing out this way with these ocean views looking out to the north. So we'll have a couple of side tables on each side of the bed, which is why we have those receptacle boxes spaced out according to the furniture plan that has been reviewed uh, with the interior designer. We've got a closet here in the bedroom. You can see a wire hanging down. This is going to be for uh, closet lighting. This is a double door, hinge door, open up. Right inside the door on the left is the switch to turn that closet light on. So that's a nice little feature there uh, for closet lighting. Back out here in the hallway, I was talking about coming down that dark hall and shutting the light off behind you and entering a dark bedroom. Well, you could do the reverse. You gotta get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. You don't wanna enter into a dark hall. 
right here outside these two bedroom doors is a hall switch that's on a three-way. What that means is there's another switch to control the hall lighting at the other end of the hall. So that's a three-way switch. So you could turn the light on here. When you get to the other end of the hall, you can shut the light off. You don't have to come back to that single location. We've got two bathrooms here. Uh, this bathroom, again, because we have an interior designer on board, we know where our uh, sconce heights need to be, where our, our exact location for our sconces need to be placed. And you can see here, we've got this pancake box here. So there'll be a fixture mounted here, probably some sort of mirror or uh, vanity or medicine cabinet here. We've got our, um, our sink base unit here, our GFI switch. And you can see right on the other side of the wall where the other bathroom is, we've got two more boxes for the sconces for that bathroom, again, because we know the locations. Now, if we did not know those locations, a tip for that is we'll often just leave a bunch of wire in the wall. And after the walls are bordered and plastered, um, and we can play around with maybe where that mirror is going and uh, the light fixture, right? There's different heights and dimensions on these light fixtures. So where does it make the most sense to put that fixture based on uh, the, the cabinet or mirror? Um, and then we can cut a hole in the wall and pull that wire through and install a different box to accommodate that light fixture. So that's something that you don't have to rewire later. The wire can kind of remain hidden in the wall. And we, what we call is leaving a whip there. It's just extra slack on the wire to deal with that location later. So at the entry for this bathroom, you see on the jam here, left hand. So again, hinge side of the door, left hand. That door is going to swing in up against this wall, which means we want our switching on the right as we're walking in. And we need four switches for this space. And as I've just mentioned, a pet peeve of mine is to not have anything more than a three gang switch. And since we need four here, we've decided to do a two over two. And you can see the back side of that here, two over two. So we're up here on the top floor. Now, if you remember in previous episodes and if you've been watching this series, this is a reverse layout. What does that mean? That means our living space is on the top floor. And the reason for that are these panoramic ocean views that are simply stunning. Our bedroom level is below us. That's where we just were walking through the electrical features uh, down in the bedrooms and those bathrooms. I'm standing in the kitchen, very large kitchen, good sized kitchen island here. You can see the island and the perimeter cabinets are taped off with this blue tape. So here's our island. We'll have a sink in it, which is why we have our hot and cold and our drainage pipe. Some wiring here for the island. By code, we're gonna need a receptacle or two on that island. And along all of our perimeter cabinets, you can see some of the electrical work here. We've got uh, some of the boxes down below for things like the, uh, the oven range. Uh, above the countertop height, you see all these boxes for um, our, our countertops, our GFIs here. And you're seeing now a different color wire. You're seeing the yellow Romex, right? You've seen uh, downstairs a lot of the white Romex, which is common. The white Romex is rated 15 amp circuit. Yellow is 20 amp, so you're going to see that in the kitchen where you have things like toasters and coffee makers and refrigerators that are going to require more amperage. Um, and oftentimes you might see even an orange wire, uh, not so much in the kitchen, but maybe in a mechanical room for uh, things like HVAC equipment and stuff that requires 30 amp uh, circuitry. So the second thing that we need here, in addition to getting that electrical work done, is our gas piping. These are the last two things. Uh, we need to get our final rough in inspection so we can move on to insulation and wallboard. Uh, our gas piping is done. We've been going through electrical work. Electrical is 90, 95% done. We're expecting that to be finished up early next week. So all of our rough in inspections should happen next week. Gas piping is ready for that inspection. So what are we looking at here? We've got a gas manifold here. Um, and our gas supply is liquid propane. There is no natural gas here on the island. Uh, so if we require gas, then we need to go with propane. So outside, we'll be installing a thousand gallon underground propane tank, and that gas will be fed in here through the main. You can see we've got a shut off here, a main shut off, and then this is branching off here in this manifold to uh, different locations here that we need gas. Uh, barbecue grill. We've got two barbecue grills out on decks that will have gas supplies. So perhaps these two are going to the grills. We've got a kitchen range that is going to require gas. We've got a fireplace uh, that is a gas fireplace. 
and we've got a couple uh, gas dryers here on the project as well. So um, we've got hard piping here coming in uh, from the tank, uh, or from the exterior to the manifold here, I should say. And then uh, off of this, we've got hard piping coming up and transitioning to flex piping. Um, so why not hard pipe this to all the locations? Uh, sure, we could do that, uh, but it is a bit easier uh, to install flex piping uh, and get that to the locations we need. Uh, it's not a clear path to those locations and the ability to use that flex pipe um, allows the uh, installer to um, get that piping to that location a lot easier. Um, so that's why we're transitioning from hard pipe to flex pipe here. And all of these red handles are our manifolds. So if you ever needed to um, do some service work or disconnect something, not only can you shut off the gas here individually, but each location also has a shut off right near that appliance. Well, it's been a very busy month out here on the project, some great progress on the exterior. And we're just a week away on the interior from having those critical final inspections so we can move on to insulation and wallboard. I'm going to stop by a couple other job sites while I'm on island, and then I've got a plane to catch. So until next time, I'm Wade Paquin with Building on an Island.